Hello, I'm Jenny Lynch, and this is the Creative Science for Kids podcast. Hi, I'm Matilda, and today's show is all about the ancient history of Australia. Let's step back in time with five fun and fascinating fast facts about how scientists date the ages of ancient artefacts. An interview with Belinda Huntress, a Warramai woman who is passionate about sharing her knowledge of Aboriginal science and technology, and a tasty sedimentary layer activity for you to try yourself at home. Listen up, because here come five fun and fascinating fast facts about the ancient history of Australia. Fact number one. Aboriginal peoples have lived on the continent that is now called Australia for over 65,000 years. European settlers arrived in Australia just over 230 years ago, and there were already people living on this land at that time. Traditional Aboriginal dreaming stories explain how people have been living on the Australian continent and taking care of the land for a very long time. Over the years, modern science has found more and more evidence showing that people have been living on the Australian continent for tens of thousands of years. Fact number two. Archaeologists study human history by looking for objects that humans have left behind. An artefact is an object that has been made or changed in some way by a human, and archaeologists search for artefacts to find out as much as they can about people who lived in the past. This often means digging into the ground to find artefacts and keeping very careful records of where each artefact was found and how deep each artefact was buried in the ground. Aboriginal artefacts that have been found in Australia include stone axes, grinding stones for preparing food, and charcoal left behind from fires. Fact number three. Science and technology can be used to work out the ages of different artefacts. When an archaeologist finds an artefact buried in the ground, they have to be very careful to record how deep the artefact was buried. Then by testing the artefact and the rocks around the artefact, they can work out when the artefact was buried and how old it might be. The oldest artefacts are buried at the deepest depths in the ground, So digging down in an archaeological excavation is a bit like travelling back in time. Fact number four. The age of plants and animals can be tested using carbon dating. Carbon dating, otherwise known as radiocarbon dating, can test the age of artefacts made from plants and animals back as far as 60,000 years. Carbon is a type of atom that is inside all living things, and there are a few types of carbon atom. The most common is called carbon-12. A less common type of carbon atom is called carbon-14. By testing how much carbon-12 there is compared to the amount of carbon-14, scientists can work out how long ago a plant or animal was alive. For example, testing the age of charcoal left behind from a fire can tell archaeologists the age of any artefacts that have been found in the same layer of ground as the charcoal. Fact number five. The time when a grain of sand was buried in the ground can be tested using luminescence dating. When carbon dating can't be used, archaeologists can sometimes use grains of sand or other materials to work out how long ago the material was buried. A type of luminescence dating was used by scientists at two different universities in Australia to test grains of sand from Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. The grains of sand had to be kept in the dark because the dating method depends on the last time the grain of sand was in sunlight. The scientists heated up the individual grains of sand to release stored energy from the sand in the form of light. They tested the light and the two different universities reached the same conclusion, that Aboriginal people were living in Arnhem Land 65,000 years ago. Let's take a deep dive into the amazing discoveries made in Arnhem Land. In Arnhem Land, there is a very important rock shelter site called Majabibi, which is on the land of the Mirar people. It's about 300 kilometres from the city of Darwin, and it's in a mining area that's surrounded by the Kakadu National Park. Archaeologists worked with the Aboriginal elders to plan an excavation of the site, and they dug down into the ground to around three metres deep. As they dug down, they passed through different sedimentary layers, which are horizontal layers of rock that build up over time. At the deepest layer, which was confirmed to be buried 65,000 years ago, the archaeologists found stone axe heads, grinding stones and ochre crayons. Ochre is a type of ground-up rock used to make art. This discovery provided evidence of continuous Aboriginal technology and culture on the land. You know the pyramids that were made in ancient Egypt? They were built 4,500 years ago, weren't they? Yes, 
They were, and Aboriginal people have been living in Arnhem Land since way before the time when the pyramids were built. With current discoveries, we know that Aboriginal peoples have lived in Australia for at least 65,000 years, and who knows what archaeologists and scientists are yet to discover about the distant past. Today we have a very special guest who is passionate about sharing knowledge about traditional Aboriginal science and technology. Can you tell us your name and a bit about what you do? My name is Belinda Huntress. I'm a Waramai woman. Originally, I'm from the mid-north coast of New South Wales, a little country town called Gloucester. I have Aboriginal and English Irish heritage on my dad's side. And in terms of what I do, I'm an Aboriginal education teacher. I teach Aboriginal perspectives in primary schools. I also have a, a family Aboriginal education consultative business. And so that is uh, called Freshwater Education. And I'm thinking just like you, I'm clearly really passionate about STEM. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about Aboriginal science and technology. Can you tell us a little bit about where you live and work? Yeah, so I'm currently living on the beautiful central coast of New South Wales on Dark and Jung country. You are interested in sharing Aboriginal history and we are very grateful to have you sharing some of your knowledge with us today. How have you learnt about Aboriginal traditional knowledge yourself? I, I would have to say in a variety of ways. Where I come from, we are a community in Gloucester that are kind of relearning cultural practices today. So, for example, you know, we've been relearning to weave language, Gatung language is being spoken again and it hasn't been spoken for around 100 years. So a lot of the stuff that I guess that I'm learning along the way has been through lots of different avenues and some of that has been being involved in some of that revitalization of cultural practices back on country. Uh, a lot of it has also been, I guess, just through my own networking within Aboriginal education and within the community in which I've been living in different places. So, you know, elders that I've connected with, community members, fam my own family, my husband's family, and a large part of that with my studies and everything like that has also been about, uh, you know, utilising research. We're looking at the whole story behind that research as well that I guess paint the Aboriginal perspective of past historical events. Uh, in, in talking about, you know, my own experiences of that kind of uh, re-engaging with cultural knowledge and, and how that was kind of disrupted, I guess it's important to understand and paint the picture of, of the impact that colonisation had on Aboriginal communities really right across the continent. When the colony expanded past Sydney and arrived in our country, in Warramai country. That happened in the 1820s and basically land was given to the convicts who had done their time and the land was then cleared so that the convicts could make farms. But within 15 years of that contact with the European people, half of our population had died from the diseases that they brought. Things like smallpox, for example, the convicts were infected with and it made our people very sick and it killed a lot of our people. And so as our people were pushed off the land, our people and the Europeans also started to fight. And so these fights happened for around 30 years. And then after that period of time, uh, Aboriginal people in the area where I'm from were taken out of the bush and were put onto uh, what we would call a mission. And that's where missionaries or church people and also government people made Aboriginal people, the word's called assimilate and assimilate means to make them into, essentially they tried to make them into European people. So they had to wear European clothes, they had to speak English, they had to give up their traditional beliefs and believe in Christianity. And so some of these things that happened to our people meant that a lot of our people today don't have a strong cultural knowledge. There's lots of reasons as to why now now, Aboriginal people are still, I guess, are reconnecting with our cultural knowledge because for a long time we weren't allowed to practice that cultural knowledge. Can you give us an example of a traditional Aboriginal science or technology? I mean, there's so many. Even an example of 
of say a possum skin cloak would be uh, a science more probably more technology based so in, in areas where where the climate was cooler is cooler like again where I come from Barrington Tops uh, our people were using possum skin cloaks and well really I, I don't believe that you can separate Aboriginal culture from sustainability because really everything our people did and do is connected to that so for example with the possum skin cloaks the possum meat would be eaten and then the fur would be used to make a cloak or like a coat it also used as a blanket and and part of that what I love about possum skin cloaks is that the fur side obviously is warm but if you flip it inside out to the skin side the skin is actually waterproof so it could then be flipped inside out to be used as a raincoat you know babies would be born using it as a blanket as they would get bigger the women would stitch other possum pelts onto the onto the original one and it would keep growing and growing to fit the size of the child i mean that's one example there's thousands of examples of how aboriginal cultural practices or perspectives fit into science do you have any advice for any listeners in australia or around the world who would like to find out more about aboriginal history and culture well, I think, especially I guess for those people that are in Australia, would be finding out about your local community. There is so much knowledge to unpack and to learn in every place that you stand in Australia. I think it's there and it's there to be learnt and we do want to share that knowledge. So I would suggest as a first point of call that you would want to connect with your local Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community. But even if we start to look at some good books, there's some great books about Aboriginal use of science and culture cultural knowledge and technology like the first scientists or the deadly science series by Corey Tutt, young dark emu or dark emu by Bruce Pascoe and but I, I guess like overall I would um stress that it's probably most important to be building relationships with Aboriginal people in your community and, and I think going to community events would probably be the easiest way to start that. Belinda Huntress, thank you so much for being a special guest on the Creative Science for Kids podcast. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. If you'd like to find out more about Belinda and the work she does with freshwater education, including embedding Aboriginal culture in the classroom, search for her website. It's Freshwater Education and we'll include a link in the show description. Archaeologists use layers of rock called sedimentary layers to help them work out the age of artefacts buried deep in the ground. You can make some edible sedimentary layers yourself by creating a tasty layered dessert. Make sure you tell an adult what you are doing first and check you have their permission. You'll need a bowl, a few spoons, a glass or tumbler, two or three biscuits or cookies of your choice, custard or chocolate pudding, chopped fruit and sprinkles. You don't have to use all of these ingredients. You might have some tastier ideas you'd like to try. First, place the biscuits or cookies on a chopping board or in a bowl and make biscuit crumbs by crushing the biscuits with the back of a spoon. Next, you will be making layers of the ingredients in the glass or tumbler by adding the ingredients one layer at a time. Start by covering the bottom of the glass with biscuit crumbs. Add a layer of custard or pudding, add a layer of chopped fruit and top it off with a few sprinkles. Repeat the layers, starting again with the biscuit crumbs, and keep adding layers until you are happy with your sedimentary layer dessert. Use a small spoon to dig into the layers and eat your dessert. You can travel back in time to a few minutes ago when you added the first layer of biscuit crumbs. Sedimentary layers form when small pieces of rock and sand and soil settle on top of each other. The layers can also include leftover material from plants and animals. As more and more layers are buried, pressure and time causes solid rock to form and this type of rock is called sedimentary rock. Time keeps marching on and it's time for us to go but before we do please remember to subscribe to the Creative Science for Kids podcast in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening and remember to stay curious. The Creative Science for Kids podcast was recorded on the traditional lands of the Bidjigal people. To find out more about Creative Science Australia, to subscribe to our email list, or to get in touch, visit creativescience.com.au.